So the Union advance is moving forward. And in terms of small unit tactics here, you know, small scale tactics in the game, rather than the strategy, not only am I advancing slowly in order to stay within my orders, but not outrun the 12th Corps here, but I'm also positioning my infantry and unlimbering guns either at three hexes or going to unlimber them behind the infantry after the infantry advances to one hex, so it's blocking the lines of sight. This is important because if I get flung back, I get defensive fire on the next turn, or even on the uh, 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 during my fire phase with my artillery. Providing that screen is the way to get your artillery up, to, up into position. You might end up taking the position but that's unlikely. The units tend to hold off uh, and attack pretty well in this system. If you're not playing with defensive uh, failure especially, but even with it, you really have to wreck a unit to start making it uh, vulnerable to falling back. Now it's time for the defensive fire. That Union advance over there was not treated at all kindly. You can see a couple of units were routed. I'm getting really, really high rolls especially on the base dice, but really on all the dice, which is unusual. I've seen a lot of casualties showing up, and I'm probably behind in count. I see four for the Union, but the Confederates also got shot up here under Jones and Lawton over here got shot as well. Not sure what by, but that should be three Confederate casualties that I haven't upgraded to yet. Anyway, one of those was from earlier. Uh, we didn't get a shot in there, but Jones got hit pretty hard too. Hard enough that we've got some low ammo markers on these units, which did the firing. Uh, overall, it's much worse for the uh, Union, though. We've got a lot of straggles here. Every time that you take a hit, you have, or even a hit that doesn't result in damage if you take a half and the rounding die doesn't give it to you, you have to roll on the straggler table. Um, we've gone over all of this in the South Mountain stuff, but I figure if you're looking at this for the first time, this is the first CWB I've done in this depth, I think. So the Union's going to get to rally. The first thing we do is we just get rid of the shaken marker, that's fine. I'm not in range of my supply wagons, so I can't uh, remove those low ammo markers, but what I have to do is I have to check uh, the rally for route, and I don't remember what the number is for that. So let's see, 24.5 here. These rules are quite large, but I'm fairly used to them. I may make some errors. Uh, we need a two or less to upgrade it, and leader's effect. So, for example, here, I don't have a leader, but here I get an extra point, so that'll be a three or less. So let's check those. First, the natural one. He's not rallying. The other one is. And we just get rid of that. This is just mechanical stuff. Put ourselves a disordered marker in place there. Hope that's the right unit. Uh, now, the one that failed his rally has to retreat so he's not within six hexes. Now, he's got a problem. He's three hexes away, so he's got a three hex retreat in place. This guy's going to have to displace to get out of the way, those displacements, if I don't displace, I'd route with them. Uh, those end up degrading the morale of the two units that just were knocked back. Why you don't want a dense formation the way I have it. And this guy pulls back to here. And that's as far as he's going. He doesn't route continually. Uh, he just gets further away, but he's got problems, no question there. And now we go over to the Confederate side of the turn. I noticed I forgot was over here. I had some artillery, so I fired not only uh, for the defensive fire for the Union turn, but also then 
uh, or, yeah, and then uh, offensive fire during the Union turn, now a defensive fire. They managed to knock out a gun there, but they blood blasted the units on top. They only got one hit out of the two shots. But the reason I wanted to come in here was in particular those low ammo units. The effect of that is a column shift against, and in fact the artillery has a column shift against because it's firing uphill here. You can kind of see there's some orange there, that's a higher elevation. That also is a column shift advantage. So there's a lot of places where terrain takes uh, some effect. Oh wait, no, there isn't. I lied. Okay, it didn't have an effect though. Uh, the die roll would have been the same either way. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, an elevation change doesn't matter. It's a slope. Slopes are these things. And then there's also extreme slopes, which may be here. They look a little bit more painful. I'm looking to see if I see one on the map. Yeah, there's some over here running along that ridge there. So those, uh, those are more of a pain to move over, but like the other slope, they just provide a one column shift in your favor. So the actual elevation change does not. But here the low ammo units will. And what I've got is uh, two big A units there. So they're going to add up the four, uh, four column, but then they, which is a good column. That's sort of the column I aim for. I try to split my fire to hit that because that has a high probability of causing some damage. Five to six, a little bit more. We're hitting ones here. These are only 50% chance of the damage, but at least they get the straggle roll, and I like that. But instead, I'm going to be over on the two column, which is just not as good. And again, I get a huge die roll. Once you're low ammo in this, you can't degrade any worse. So that's going to cause one casualty. I make a leader loss check because I'm firing at J.R. Jones there. He's in charge of Jackson's division. A nine isn't going to do anything. It's extreme rolls over here. Um, okay, so what did I say I had? I had a, just a one hit. That's on oh, this poor unit. This thing's almost demolished here. The TJ2, I think it's going to dissolve. Not quite yet let's see he's taken also the rounding die doesn't matter this one matters uh, he's a b morale he was on the one and a half table or no he's on the one table but he gets a plus two to the die roll because he's a wrecked unit over here so he ends up at an eight he's going to straggle two now one of them comes off talifiero but the other one is going to come off that St. Joe or whatever. Uh, the Stonewall Brigade. Yeah. <laughs> you can see how quickly that force is just dissolving. This uh, Jackson's division is quite small. Um, and then we make a morale check on them with a 12. Now, the Stonewall Brigade's all that's left. He's an A. He's up one because of the leadership, which is going to be another bloodlust marker for the Confederates. That doesn't help a whole hell of a lot. It Not with small units, because that thing's about ready to dissolve anyway. Now, this is not completely gone. I can bring it back on our turns. Uh, in term, when, when an hour, uh, a turn for an hour comes during my player turn during the rally phase, well, actually before that, I place a straggler recovery marker, which are over here, and then I get uh, a roll to try to recover strength points from the stragglers. I can do that with other units too, but not the ones that are on the line. They're too close. You have to be outside of four hexes, I think, for that to matter. Now the Confederates get to fire back, and they got a lot of artillery still on the line, so they're going to be, um, you know, I'm within three hexes here, so I'm going to continue firing on the Union troops. If you're within four, if you're outside of three hexes, it's not worth firing on your own uh, phase. Uh, during the rally phase, those bloodlusts are going to automatically disappear because the Confederates did not, are not adjacent to the enemy. If they were adjacent to the enemy, then they'd have a chance over here on this table to keep their blood lost. And we got these guys slowly trickling on the board. I'm not a big fan of fixing bayonets, but I've decided to do it over here in part because of knowledge that maybe I wouldn't have. Here's the problem. Uh, 
I know that the units in here are very, very tidy and that I might be able to wipe them out and get to those guns. I'm going to undertake hellacious fire coming in. But, uh, well, it seems worthwhile, right? Um, the question is whether or not I would know that. Now, I should know the fire level that's available there. And that fire level is under an A. I believe it's actually a C. Just a matter of being able to look at the front and see there ain't a lot of guys there. I think anything that's A or higher I wouldn't be able to recognize, but it, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, what, what the fog of war situation is. This is clearly in view. You're not going to short, you're not going to close combat something that's not in view. And it's also, uh, you know, under strength, even at the very front line. So it's not like I'm not sure how much depth there is there. Normally, I'd like to keep these secret, though. And if I was playing an opposed game, I might not be aware of that. I think putting the little B and C counters underneath units helps define that. If you see that there's only one combat counter there, uh, and you can kind of see that that's a big stack. See, that's the problem. <laughs> the stack, it's not apparent that it's a B or C counter. It could be another combat counter under there. And you're not allowed to paw through the opponent's stacks. All you're allowed to do is ask, is there artillery there? Is there infantry there? Those are your questions that you're allowed to ask. Unfortunately, I think you should know that the line is very weak there just because you'll see the frontage has few men on it. Anyway, melee combat is done during uh, the actual movement phase. Uh, I'm moving the first division. This is actually the Iron Brigade here, uh, which changes numbers throughout its period. I had to Google that over a bar bet, uh, which I lost. Um, so we march it uh, basically from here, I think, one, two, three, four, plus one for the close combat is five. He's got an extra movement point after the close combat if he wants to. The way the close combat is done is it's going to follow a sequence here. First, both sides are going to conduct fire combat on each other. And then the attacker has to check a morale at minus six, and the defender checks a morale at minus four. So the fire combat isn't going to be your normal fire combat. I'm not going to roll all the dice. I'm going to roll everything except the morale check. And we'll do the attacker's combat first. He's an A quality unit. Nothing special here. He's got. Eight points of fire points coming in. Nothing special. And we get a one and a half. This is the rounding die, so we only do one hit. To the STJ. Unfortunately, this is harder to do without hands. One hit to the STJ. Now I have just wiped out the Confederate unit. So I do not have to roll. Well, that's the Stonewall Brigade I'm facing. I don't have to roll, um, or I don't have to take the straggler into account there. But the artillery is going to have to make a morale check. I have to make a leader loss check, though. Got Jones there. He's fine. Now, for the Confederates, they get to fire back. They're only a C firepower at the time that this started. That gives them, at range one, only two firepower. And a nice big roll for the Confederates again, one that doesn't even cost that. So they take a hit. Speaking of which... I'm really bad at keeping track of death. Um, so we did a hit to the Iron Brigade, and we slide this under. 411. It does not 
need the rounding die and as to a straggle it's not going to straggle. Now the Iron Brigade has to take its morale check. Everything's kind of interleaved here with the fire combat. It's an A morale unit. Now if it was bloodlusted it would be breaking it on here and it couldn't possibly be flung back but as it is it's got minus six so it's over on the D table. And a 31 on the D is shaken. I'm still in the combat. Oh, shit. It took more damage. Um, I had a 10 roll. I wanted to fire my artillery there. Yeah, no doubt. I've got four cannon. At close combat was eight extra strength points, so I was actually on the nine table. I did two hits instead of one on them. Let's just fudge that up. Okay. So, I'm still okay on the morale. Now, I've got a C morale artillery. I think all artillery is C morale. Uh, I don't know if it says it on the guns. It doesn't even have the morale on them. And that's going to be down four, which puts me on the E table. 63, he's not going to stick. He's disorganized back to straggle one. Well, he doesn't straggle. But what he does do is he rolls on the gun loss table because he's unlimbering, or he's limbering, with enemy units next to him. And he's okay there with a roll of two. So, what was it? Disorganized back two. And Jones actually can't be in this hex, according to the rules of this game. Now, this is screwy again, because I think under normal circumstances, with Jones bolted down, that would have been an emergency division retreat. If I'm playing with the way the regular rules work. Uh, basically, because there's no rear command areas for these independent divisions, you've got to assign a unit to defend the general or else that part of the general's line cracks. It just, it does not work. Um, RSS had some answers to this, which was, hey, you can bolt just the general down. That kind of works, but uh, then he ends up not being able to really help his troops at all. You wanted that command uh, center that is key to the cores in this game. Uh, and, and not having it really kind of... Having all the divisions operate on divisional goals kind of ruins the whole thing. Uh, anyway, I've got another movement point, but I don't really have anywhere to go. One thing I have to do is consider which way I want to face, and I want to face this way so I, I don't get an end full on it anywhere. Uh, when you do close combat, sometimes you break a line in a way that you get some nice end full odd shots, but that's not happening here. At the end of the uh, Union side of the turn, you can see many of the units I think you had seen before that were disorganized and whatnot. They've begun recovering. We're getting in better shape. The Union's taken some pretty significant losses if my numbers are correct. And if anything, they're low. We're at 12 there. And only 6 for the Confederates. The Confederates, on the other hand, have been pumping a lot of artillery fire. I probably started firing a little too early some of that long-range plinking. We're down to uh, 227. <coughs> which is a decent amount missing. Uh, we're going to start the Confederate turn. We've got these units back here. i got to find the commander for that. Jones, he's back here. One, two, three, four. I can start recovering stragglers back there. The rest of the line... Some of them could be recovering stragglers if I wasn't being pressed right now, but I'm too close to the enemy to do so, so 
this is really the only place that I can do it. And at the same time, I'll be trying to think, is there anything that I can do to bolster my defenses? How worried am I about them? If I start shifting forces over, I open up a hole that McClellan could exploit. I really don't have a lot of extra troops right now. I just have the things coming in as they come in. See, I could go give orders to someone else and then plan on filling that gap uh, in time. Might be possible to get... Uh, Jones's divi division up there moving. In general, Lee's probably good enough to command this whole army just by running around giving orders to each thing, given McClellan's uh, incompetence. The Confederate side of things, I moved Lee over here with the thought of shifting at least one more division into the fray over here. I can these guys are going to be moving up to the headquarters and they can uh, to fill in Jones's command there or his uh, place in the line. Over, and this line is really poorly defended. There's like artillery stretched out here and because of divisional orders, these guys can't actually go up and do anything to protect that artillery. It's just exposed out there, uh, which is bothersome. But anyway, over here, uh, the Confederates mainly have blown back most of the uh, attack that came close. The Iron Brigade was sent in disordered retreat. And it, it's not looking too glorious in this game. It just pretty much got itself chewed to bits in the early part of the attack. Uh, we're also seeing the 12th Corps getting pretty ha badly hammered with that slow approach. The slow approach against artillery is not a good thing. You kind of want to do a launch, a mass charge, but that's ugly too. I mean, this is just a powerful Confederate position. You know, just the amount of troops and guns there. This was not the place to attack, but hey, it's McClellan. Speaking of which, i got to give him another McClellan point. I don't know. It's hard for me to keep track of all these bookkeeping things. The artillery I can handle, the McClellan points, I'm going to forget a lot. The deaths... Don't really matter. I can add them up at the end of the game off the charts. Uh, both of this is the other Jones. Both of his units ended up uh, coming back into existence. Uh, tiny little units, though. There's not much there. The Stonewall Brigade, especially. Uh, I can't do a hell of a lot with a wrecked Stonewall Brigade, right? <laughs> And it is wrecked, I think, even with just one loss. No, no, it has to disintegrate to wreck. Hmm. Okay. I gotta keep track of these two because Talafiero is permanently wrecked, but I should have had that marked off too. Uh, so we're moving into the 730 turn. And I think I've taken care of everything here. The Union pushed up. Within one hex range, just about all along the line. Some of them got pushed back. You can see there's a shaken unit there. Uh, but most of those I've already recovered from. I did my rally phase already. So that line was all shaken. What it did do, see, this is how I like to launch my attacks. My friend, uh, an old friend of mine, used to like to believe, eh, I can't get in there and stay at one hex range. So I'm gonna close assault. I'm gonna I'm gonna do the melee combat. That makes sure that I get my shot in at good range. My feeling is uh, usually I would rather set my line up, unlimber my artillery one hex back, and then that's what I did here. When I get pushed back, I got my guns, so I get a good shot in anyway. It's actually the guys who stayed up there who were in more questionable position, to tell you the truth. Although, I'm only screening, I think, one gun back here. I think there's one unlimbered there. I'm not positive. Uh, all right, on to the Confederate turn. Okay, another little educational moment here. I've moved Lee into place uh, with Jones last turn. So now he's written an order. Um, write down the order number at the time of arrival. Uh, I'm going to do an in-person verbal 
simple order. It's going to be to just move to the west woods and provide a defensive positioning there. And uh, I gave it 4-0 because I did decide to pull out the Series 3.0 rules. There are some differences there. One of the major ones is the use of force in orders is now somewhat of a penalty. Basically, you can issue a number of force points in orders equal to the square of the rating of the leader. So Lee, with a rating of 4, has 16 force points he can throw out over the course of the game. Uh, generally, everybody would make force two orders in the old rules. Now, with this potential cost, if you spend more than 16, you start accumulating anti-initiatives. Um, there's a little chart here. And I think this is nice because, you know, Lee didn't generally tend to say, get your ass over there. He would, he would express his orders as, I believe it would be wise if you were to shift your forces over to help the defense of this line. Um, and he didn't really crack down on, on his generals very much. So, in a sense, this is being Lee. Now, I, he worked very well with this uh, style of orders giving in general, but anyway. What happens is if you exceed that number, you start picking up uh, a number of anti-initiatives, which actually eventually end up being column shifts against you over on this table. Anyway, what happened was we added up the uh, sender and receiving leader. That's six points there, four for Lee and two for Jones. It's an in-person verbal, so that brings it up to eight. Force was zero, so that brings it to seven. It's a simple order. I rolled on the seven table and I got a seven. That's gonna be a D1. So he doesn't get to roll for delay reduction immediately, but you know, starting next turn, I believe it was a one or a two. I thought it was a five or a six, the opposite, whatever, <laughs> that I stated from before. Uh, in order to get that force moving, and then it'll try to get here. If it ends up in a situation where it's no longer able to move forward within its own friendly lines, it'll halt at really at uh, beyond close fire range. Now this is kind of tricky because I can move into the location I'm expecting to move into that's in my uh, defensive lines and move right up and defend the territory I'm supposed to defend. But if these forces have fallen back, I'll continue moving as close as I can get without entering small arms range. Anyway, uh, that's just some little ways of interpreting what these orders rules mean that maybe isn't completely obvious, but that's the way I look at it. All right, well, uh, I guess I'll start moving my forces. And we got these reinforcements beginning to make their way over to the headquarters. Now, one of the other restrictions is I have to walk back to the headquarters and recharge before I can do another in-person verbal order. Once per day, I can do a conference where I gather a bunch of people and give them one uh, complete set of orders. This is how the game used to play up until this Series 3 rolls. Is, you know, Lee would run around all over the field. His headquarters doesn't really mean anything. He would just run everywhere and you know, talk to whoever he likes. With divisional commanders, that's really important because they can't come back and talk at the Army headquarters. With Corps commanders, generally, well they could run back to the headquarters anyway. So once you get the core command in place, and the Union has that, there's not really a big deal about the headquarters still. Uh, you're able to do the in-person verbals right at the headquarters location. Lots of chatter for no good reason, but well, it's one of the big factors for me about the Series 3 rolls, which adds some interesting, interesting little pieces to the game. So at the end of the uh, 7.30 turn, the Confederates have maintained bloodlust on a couple of their units. They Doing a lot to drive off that Union attack. Uh, right now I've got it marked at 33 casualties for the Union. I don't know if that's correct or not, but you can see this is the 1st Division here with... Uh, sorry, 1st Corps with two divisions wrecked. They're going to have trouble maintaining their attack. And remember the 12th, although it's getting chewed up too, um, not as badly. It is reliant upon that 1st Corps' movement. And I'm not... There's no way to inactivate 
that unit. I can send it new orders or roll for initiative or something, but I can't reduce its commitment. And it's not going to be fighting, which is a problem for uh, for McClellan. Um, as long as it hasn't failed a core attack stop, it's checked. Now, it continues to check even long after it's disengaged. But uh, in, until that point, it's got some problems there. Although we haven't lost Hooker yet. He hasn't left the game. Uh, Hood was wounded. Got him marked over here. I don't know if that's not worth any victory points, no matter how you look at it. Uh, probably got an arm torn off or a leg or something. He had a tendency to lose limbs, cities, women, his sanity. Uh, and let's see, one thing I forgot uh, about the rules for this, as opposed to South Mountain, in this one you have to track the individual ammo for small arms resupply. So all my uh, supply units now have a number of uh, resupplies they're allowed to make. Once they use them all up, they have to go back to the army supply train for the Union. That's kind of a tough trip for the Confederates. It's not so bad, probably. Uh, and get within range of that and resupply their, their stockpile. For some reason, the RSS doesn't use that even though it uses a more detailed artillery ammunition supply set of rolls. Very strange, especially in something like South Mountain where you have uh, small arms supply wagons or, or core supply wagons being quite far from where they could reasonably have gotten resupplied. So that, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm a little stunned by the fact that the RSS doesn't go to this level of detail when CWB has always had this. Uh, all right, well, we'll move forward. The incredible power of a bloodlusted unit is revealed here. Um, that was over here with this unit. He marched up the hill, hit these guys. Both sides fire. Humongous penal uh, losses for the Union. Basically, I think two strength point losses on the attack uh, because he's facing something like the 16 column. Uh, four guns at close combat is worth eight, and then an A quality unit is worth another eight. Heavy, heavy hit there. But he holds his, his uh, morale check. The Confederates hold their morale check, but then on the odds table, the one to one odds, the Union gets a uh, six on their result. <clears throat> and that forces the defenders to push back, to fall back. They lose some guns, and they end up having to make yet another morale check after they fall back. Then, since I didn't lose my bloodlust on my first attack, you had to check over here, I uh, continued on and took another two hits in casualties, but struck another position, and this time the Confederates lost their morale check, even though these were like, you know, high-quality units, a, a morale in the second case. Still, it's got a minus four on the morale check for uh, receiving uh, a charge. The attacker gets a minus six on his morale check, which makes it very, very difficult to hold the position unless you're bloodlusted. Generally, the attacker breaks before he actually uh, succeeds in making his hit. I like doing the close combat with bloodlusted units. I think it's valuable in that case. I think in the other circumstances, it's just too much of a penalty. But here, not only did I gain some territory, but I've got an enfilade now set up against this unit. So I'll be getting some massive uh, bonuses on firing on it. Unfortunately, I've also wrecked my unit. It will not bloodlust. It will not be able to uh, close combat attack again. But it may have been worthwhile uh, on that attack. Now I'll continue on. I'm moving my way down the line. These guys kind of covering and opening, uh, you know, the 12th Corps opening up, trying to fire on this uh, side of things. But as we're breaking through this part of the line, it's going to be tougher for the Confederates to hold their Casualties are really beginning to mount here. This Union attack is uh, yeah, beginning to punch some holes in the Confederate positions as well as cause some significant casualties. Over on the Confederate side, we're looking at 2,900 casualties so far. For the Union, much, much scarier. What is it? I uh, got 4,700 men dead. 
it's always expensive to attack in this game. And as we push into the 30 turn, things are looking pretty ugly for the Confederates. This side here, these two units are both just artillery. This one just one gun. They've driven the infantry off of them, or dissolved them more to the point. A lot of ammo depletions. The Confederates wiped out the uh, Union unit that got itself there. They managed their own enfilades against it and dissolved it. You can see they're cracking up the 12th Corps here pretty badly too, routing it away. The real question is uh, whether or not the Union's uh, Corps continue moving. If they end up uh, failing their core stoppage, they pull back. Otherwise, they're pretty much guaranteed to take that region here. Jones here has started moving forward. We got uh, we got the one or two we needed to succeed in the D1. So he's now going to fill in that gap. So if we don't take it, if, if we don't, if we get our core stoppage, chances are we're not going to take any of this stuff here for quite some time because these corps are pretty much wrecked at this point. We got uh, the 12th Corps, both divisions. Well, one division's not wrecked yet, but it's close. And then over here for the 1st Corps, we've got two wrecked divisions again out of three. So, hey, it's not terribly likely they're going to be able to keep going. Uh, we got Franklin's 6th Corps coming in next turn, not... Not this one upcoming, but the one after that. And uh, maybe I can activate. I've sent uh, McClellan over to try to activate the 5th Corps and sweep down this way towards Sharpsburg itself and, and knock that out of, out of commission. This was an incredibly powerful position, and we've seen some pretty, pretty heavy fighting so far in this morning. And for the Union side of the turn... The uh, Union forces are continuing their attack over here. We'll get to that in a moment. But McClellan issued orders to the 5th Corps. Now, they're in D2, which means... Jesus, what do they need? A 1? To succeed? Yeah, they, they have a 1 in 6 chance on any given turn to activate and start doing anything. That's just standard rules. Quite often the case. But, the 3rd edition rules and McClellan's lousy rating, that 0 rating, meant that... I can't issue an order with any force. If I issue an order with force, I'm going to have anti-initiatives immediately because the square of zero is still zero. So I have no leeway here. So even though this is an important order, I don't want to be left with a penalty on the rest of my orders for the rest of the game. Uh, as McClellan, you know, I don't know, tweaks out too much here. So I ended up with a D2, which is not the worst. It could have been distorted, I guess. But D2s can be pretty bad. You can sit there for, you know, hours and hours not doing anything. Anyway, Porter's orders are to advance down the Boonesboro Road to about here and then launch an attack up uh, until the woods and the church are taken, then double back and head back into Sharpsburg. This is the kind of uh, orders that I like to write in this game where I, I try to anticipate everything I need. Now, this is <clears throat> a little extreme for the simple fact that I didn't expect these guys to continue onward. Um, basically, I'm trying to catch these the Confederates in a pincer and then turn back and take the valuable area of 13 victory points for Sharpsburg and squat there. Once I can squat there, I can start moving other forces, like, say, uh, what is, what do I have, the second, second Corps back there? I could move that forward, or the incoming uh, Sixth Corps under Franklin could come forward. However, the First Corps especially, but even the Twelfth, did quite a damn good job here. Meade came charging down. He actually did a uh, melee again, or a close combat. Took out... A bunch of guns, four of them, then got a flank uh, enfilade. This one managed to chase uh, the troops that were assailing it from the front away, but Meade got an enfilade shot on it and finished the last gun out there. So the guns anchoring this uh, flank are gone, and now we also chased the uh, Confederate guns off this hilltop here with some counter battery fire. Now, the Union's definitely taken a lot of losses. I don't know if my numbers are correct. The other thing to keep an eye on is Confederate artillery uh, ammo. We're down in the 80s now. 
you know, I mean, I don't know where 60 points went, <laughs> but it sure went real fast. It's not, you know, it, it's, uh, it's not even 9 a.m. And, uh, you know, there's a significant amount of the game left, and I've used eh, about a third of my ammo already, a little more than a third. Uh, on the other hand, I'm losing guns, so that's going to make it tougher. The Confederates have to figure out where to set their next line up. This has pretty much failed them. And one of the problems is I've got to start using Longstreet and Jackson to try to roll for initiative. Or maybe send Lee up there and, and, and write orders. Uh, because as it stands, I can't keep the orders I have. Now, I could do an emergency core withdrawal or an emergency division withdrawal or whatever by just declaring, hey, uh, I'm about ready to be eliminated. But I don't feel like that's the fact here. I really don't feel like I'm in that much danger. So I'd be leery of doing it. And also when you do that, you end up causing uh, straggler effects on all the units of that uh, formation that withdraws. So there's a cost to it as well. I think I can hold off and do a fighting withdrawal. If I had a core, you know, back here where I would expect to, I could fall back on that core headquarters and it would give me some time and some leeway. I don't have that because of the stupid organizational rules for, um, for these early battles, which again, I, I really do not like the way they work. I think it's the biggest point against three battles of Manassas against this uh, game. Seven days. The Confederates just do not have the ability. Now, it's fine when you're on attack, whenever that happens, but it does not work when you're trying to defend. And I feel like South Mountain actually handled that with the uh, divisional uh, center markers that work like headquarters. That's probably an idea I should import into these guys. Um... Anyway, I'm on to the Confederate side. This poor thing is routing away from the battle. Uh, he stops out there, but, you know, he's, uh, he's not pressing forward. And, of course, that whole assault could end at any moment. That's a, another factor I can look at. I'm looking at, what do I need? Fives for the uh, first core to keep moving and sixes for the twelfth uh, core to keep moving. And if these guys are stranded out there trying to march and do this operation without them there, that's going to be ugly. Although, they still do manage to encircle this. What they're not going to be able to do, and they don't have orders to do, is take out the sunken road. My hope is to make the sunken road such an extended location that the Confederates can't dare hold it any longer. Uh, but... Its defensive position makes it tough, unless I'm attacking it from both sides or uh, coming from the uh, ends of it. It's going to be able to hold out pretty well. I've seen those things do pretty amazing stuff when you've got entrenchments or the sunken road is treated as an entrenchment. It's pretty tough. Uh, we got our reinforcements coming up who have orders to defend something that maybe they don't hold anymore. <laughs> All right. Okay, the Confederates move to the 9 a.m. turn. And what we've seen, new orders written for McLaws division here to go fill the gap that Jones freed up. The basic feeling there is, well, it's going to take the Union a while to get moving, so I could have shifted, so I was able to shift Jones, but I'd better fill that gap in in case it gets attacked. And in fact, what we saw was as Jones left, the Union threw orders to the 5th Corps that essentially do march right up that line. So we'll see who gets their orders first. Uh, we got a D1 for McLaws there. I've moved Jackson to, take, uh, to sit on top of Jones here. The intention is to roll for initiative, maybe put him over on Hauser Ridge. Uh, I'm kind of more worried about an outflank here. I'm pulling Stewart's cannons and his cab out of the way. I'm going to pull them back there. I don't need orders to do that. They can operate uh, freely, if you recall. I've also pulled Longstreet over to take uh, Evans's division and try to move that somewhere. I'm not quite sure where again. Uh, I might want to tighten up the D.H. Hill line here uh, and, and send him right up there. But on the other hand, I really do need reinforcements in this area still. The main point 
the Confederates have been kind of pulling back deeper, uh, getting themselves concealed, so there wasn't really any fire, just a little bit of a counter-battery fire against some limber guns over here that the Union had exposed. <laughs> Uh, they got uncovered because of some units being driven away, and they took a, a loss from that. Uh, guess that's about it, but we got another big unit coming in here, another core. I think we're going to send this one off. I feel like we've reached sort of an inflection point. I'm not sure because the Union attack is still continuing, but we don't know when that's going to end. We've used up a lot of video here. Uh, not much has been gained yet just the cornfield, but these are very clearly threatened.